and outcompeting native fauna, especially native mussels, for habitat and food. There is a gross lack of literature on zebra mussels in streams and rivers, and that's because they thrive and are in fact native to lakes and reservoirs of Asia. This is why I chose to focus my study on the early detection of zebra mussels in the flowing environment of the Meredithine River. So I chose uh, 12 sites from my positive source reservoir at Melbourne, moving downstream to Lacine at the Missouri border. And at each of these sites, I compared four standard operating procedures that are uh, employed by most state agencies to determine which method um, would give the earliest indication of a zebra mussel infestation. So the four methods are visual search, where we looked through uh, each site sampling hard surfaces looking for settled zebra mussels. Colonization substrate where we deployed our own hard surfaces uh, for zebra mussels to settle on. Co uh, Cross-polarized light microscopy where I looked at water samples looking for zebra mussel larvae. And environmental DNA or eDNA where I took a water sample, isolated total DNA, uh, amplified it using zebra mussel target specific primers and uh, ran a gel electrophoresis, which gave an indication of whether or not zebra mussel DNA was present in that water sample. So what I found so far is that visual search and cross-polarized light microscopy have uh, given the greatest number of positive detections further downstream than either of the other two methods. And um, the capability of all four of these methods diminished as you move downstream. I've also found that some of the sites with slower moving water have had the be a better likelihood of producing a positive visual search, colonization substrate, or cross-polarized light microscopy detection, but not an environmental DNA detection, which the environmental DNA only was positive in the source reservoir and the site closest to the source reservoir. I've also found that the density of both settled and larval zebra mussels decreased as distance from the source reservoir increased, um, which may be a reason why the eDNA does not uh, pop positive on any of the sites downstream. Uh, and that kind of suggests that eDNA might be more density dependent than any of the other methods. So I'd particularly like to thank ESU for my research grant and thank the panel of judges today. Good afternoon. Stress, as we're all familiar with, can have a detrimental impact on things like behavioral and physiological responses. So in the short term, stress, much like I might be experiencing right now, <laughs> causes a change in the, in the hormones that uh, circulate in the bloodstream. In the short term, that will cause changes in things like respiration rate and heart rate. If those, con those concentrations stay elevated for an extended period of time, that will in turn cause changes in Two of, the ratio, two of the white blood cells that are responsible for fighting disease and infection. So stress that's experienced for a long period of time can have a detrimental effect on the body's ability to fight disease. As researchers, it's important that we be able to make sure that we are not causing any undue stress to the animals that we're subjecting to whatever we're subjecting them to. So it's important that we be able to not only identify but quantify where it is that this stress is coming from. And that was the focus of my research, was to identify is there some amount of stress that we can contribute only to being held in captivity if we eliminate all other human-induced sources. So to do this, for the short term, 
we measured corticosterone levels, which is the stress hormone that reptiles have in, in their blood serum. And we also measured for the long term the changes in those two white blood cells, which are the two down in the bottom. In an unstressed state, the lymphocytes, the blue one, is have very high in number. And the number of heterophils is very low. After long-term stress, that situation actually is reversed. And so we can measure that change and determine whether or not that animal and how much that stress that animal is experiencing. So what I did was I went out into the field, caught some snakes, took a blood sample out of their tail, out of the caudal vein, took them to the lab and held them in the lab for two weeks, took another blood sample, and then let them go. What we found was that after two weeks, these individuals were still having a short-term stress response. So their corticosterone levels were still increased. Surprisingly, what we found was that their long-term stress response, those two blood cells ratios had decreased. So for 74% of these individuals, being in the lab was a less stressful experience than whatever was going on in their life in the wild. Now for, as a researcher, that means that not only can we say that being held in the lab is not causing them stress, but two weeks might be a good baseline to say, this is where we need to, to hold them. Thank Time. you. Time. <laughs> so my thesis research was on communication in salamanders, specifically a small mouth salamander, there's one on the left up there. That's a salamander we have around here. They spend uh, most of their time on land, and then they return to water just to breed and lay their eggs uh, in small pools. Um, so as far as communication in salamanders, if you ask someone who studies amphibians how do salamanders communicate with each other, they will almost certainly tell you that it's through smell, uh, chemicals, or by touch. Um, if you then ask them, okay, can they communicate with sounds vocally, um, they will get them to certainly tell you, no, they can't because salamanders are deaf, or at least very bad at hearing, and they're mute. They can't produce sounds at all. This is kind of the common knowledge that everyone inherits when they start this kind of research, um, and it has been for decades and decades. Well, um, that's not really true. So even this specific salamander uh, that I was looking at, and others, uh, it's been shown that they can, in fact, hear much better when they're underwater than when they're in the air, but they can, in fact, hear. Um, and in addition, I've heard, when looking at these guys in the wild, I've heard them actually make very clear, distinct clicking noises when in my hand. So that led me to ask, okay, they're clicking up in the air where I can hear them, could they also be clicking <coughs> underwater where I can't hear them, but they can hear each other? And that's during their mating season, so all sorts of possibilities open up with that. Um, and again, no one has really looked at this at all. Um, so what I did to test this was I had on the right there, you can see a picture, these small little artificial pools to kind of simulate breeding pools that I stuck either a single salamander in or a male-female pair or um, a same-sex pair. And then I put a hydrophone, you can see it coming in on the, the left, in to detect any sounds that they were making. And I did this, first of all, to detect are they making the sounds. And then secondly, um, to try and pin down some sort of social context. Are males doing it more often when a female is around, for example? Um, and what I found was they actually were clicking underwater, and most of them did. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I wasn't able to find any social context yet, uh, at least not with this setup. They all seemed to do it about the same amount. Um, but even just having it on record that they are in fact vocalizing is kind of a huge step forward because for decades and decades, no one has ever, ever heard any of that. To put it quite literally. Um, so that opens up all sorts of new avenues of, of research uh, as far as pinning down what exactly are they doing under there. So that's it. You can come see my poster if you want. <laughs> My thesis project has been over the synthesis of thermostable DNA polymerase and fluorescent protein chimeras for PCR study. 
First of all, a chimera is a DNA molecule with sequences derived from two or more different organisms formed by laboratory manipulation. The proteins I'm working with, um, first and foremost, are polymerase chain reaction PCR enzymes, which are polymerases to copy DNA. This um, technique got the 1993 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, um, and it has revolutionized um, all biochemistry and molecular biology techniques since. Um, to this protein, or these class of proteins, I am adding uh, fluorescent protein molecules. Uh, this technique got the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Um, the fusion and co-expression of fluorescent protein molecules with cellular localization um, proteins has uh, completely changed the way that uh, cellular proteins are visualized. So the proteins that I worked with, first of all for PCR are uh, Thermos Aquaticus or TAC because it was the original PCR enzyme used. And then Pyrococcus furiosus um, is another PCR enzyme which is used more nowadays because it has higher fidelity and thermal stability. To these proteins I have used uh, TD tomato, first of all because it's very bright. Um, and then secondly, ZS Green and ZS Mutant. ZS Green because it's highly thermostable and it's in a monomer uh, form, which means it's half the size of a TD tomato, which is a tannic dimer. Um, ZS Mutant is important because it was discovered in Dr. Kim Sun's lab by a student and is otherwise unknown, so we tried to use it for something. Once we have these uh, chimeras produced and functional, we will use them to study the kinetics of the PCR reaction of uh, oligo binding and uh, polymerase binding and precession. Also, this can be used for um, just use of PCR because it's very air prone to make small volumes of uh, clear substances. So if we had colored substances, that would be uh, very useful for preparation of PCR reactions. And that's all I have. I was interested in what makes a good teacher, particularly does someone who's warm make a better teacher than someone who's not? And warm being uh, interactive, passionate, are they, uh, are they interested in what they teach? Do they appear to be interested in their students? And also I want to know if, if students perceive warmth in a female teacher different than warmth in a male teacher. Maybe uh, there's a stereotype that women should be warm and men can kind of get away with not being warm. Maybe, you know, that's kind of the thought. Um, and so what I did what, to test that was I, I looked at uh, classes of students and I had, uh, actually I gave a presentation in a warm way and then I gave one in a cold way, a disinterested way. And I had a man, a male friend of mine, give the same presentation that I did, the same, pre uh, same PowerPoints, same words we, we practice, same, the same, same rate of speech, same mannerisms, but with, uh, he did it also in a cold way and in a warm way with the students. And we looked at, uh, we had the students take a quiz over the material to see, did they actually learn, learn more from someone who was warmer or from someone who was colder? And did they learn more from the male or the female? Just, just to look at it. And uh, what, what I found was that the students actually, they did learn more, they did, got better scores on the quiz from the warm teachers than from the cold teachers. And they got better scores from the woman than from the man. Uh, which, which may have been because uh, I'm a GTA, so I have some teaching experience and the man didn't. But it was interesting because they rated, uh, they, they rated the warm teachers better, which you would expect, but then they also uh, rated the man and the woman similarly. So they thought that they were similar even though they actually learned more from the woman. So kind of interesting. It shows that, uh, that warmth actually is important. It, it's important to the students. They rate teachers better. They think that they're better teachers if, they, if they're warm. And it shows that, uh, that they, also, they also learn more. Not, not only is it important to the students, but it's important to their learning. They 
seem to be more engaged in the learning and they actually pick up more of the material. So um, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Jin Zheng. Today, I will give a brief introduction of my project. The goal of my project is to study the interaction between CDC 14 and 6015. First, I want to talk about why this is important for us. Cell, CDC stands for cell division cycle. Cell division cycle is a really highly relate, re regulated process and it plays a crucial role in all biological growth and development. If the cell division cycle is out of control, the cell will proliferate crazily and lead to the formation of the malignant tumor. CDC 14 has, has found been to regulate the cell division cycle. So if we can find a protein that can regulate the CDC 14, we could also regulate the cell division cycle and prevent the formation of the malignant tumor. CDC15 is such a candidate that can interact with CDC14. Uh, thus, a, in, a study on the interaction between CDC14 and CDC15 will give us more new ideas for basic research. Then, how would we achieve this in our lab? First, we will clone the genes from the Easter genome, and then we will use uh, a special bacterial system to produce these two proteins. After we purify these two proteins, we will make several assays to test their activities and their interaction between them. Hopefully, we could use a computer to predict the three-dimensional structure of these, these proteins, which will give us more accurate information at the molecular level. Those are in, in vitro studies. At the same time, my lab partner is doing an in vivo study in the East. Because the genes in the East are very related, are highly related to the genes in human, hum, hum, human genome. So, the conclusions from both the in vitro and in vivo study can be further used to design new drugs or therapies for patients who are suffering from the cancer. That's all about my project, and thank you for giving me this chance to share my project. Thank you. Loans and credit is something that's a way of life, particularly for students. Add in grad school, things get a little more complicated. You get a loan, you pay tuition, you put it in the bank. You quickly take it out of the bank to pay off those credit cards you've been relying on a little bit too much. Then you graduate and you have to pay the loan back. This is a cycle that many people have to deal with. Now, what would happen if I put that cycle on a larger level? If I took it from the personal to the international, from a student graduating to the completion of a war. This is the case with World War I. A hundred years ago, a single bullet reshaped the societal, political, and economic makeup of the entire globe. Um, war itself fundamentally changed, and therefore other aspects had to change as well, particularly economics. For the countries fighting the war had to ask the same question a student does. How are we going to pay for this? For France and England, it was loans from the United States. For Germany, that wasn't an option. And in 1919, a defeated Germany signed the Treaty of Versailles, which stated that they had to pay reparations to the victorious powers, particularly France and Germany. Now, I'm not here to hash out the reparations debate, talk about its merits, or its legality, or its morality. I focus on that because the 1920s is a watermark in uh, global, international, economic history. It's at this point where American businessmen, lenders, and leaders were asked to come take a role that they would have for the rest of the 20th century. In this instance, it was Owen Young and Charles Dawes being asked to come to Paris and London to lead a commission to set up a plan for reparations. This plan, known as the Dawes Plan, functioned for a few years pretty well before it collapsed. You will find it in any 
uh, high school history textbook. It will talk about the loans from the United States to Germany, reparations from Germany to the Allied powers, and then paying their debts back to the United States. There's that cycle. What scholarship has not touched on yet is what went on in this commission, the attitudes of the members of this commission, what were their motivations. By going in to the Charles Dawes collection at Northwestern University, I have found these correspondences, I have found these journals, I have found these accounts. And what I intend to argue is that the motivations were not single. It was not particularly economically based or trying to get this system for the United States to get interest. It was more broad, larger in scope, and focused on rebuilding Germany. I'm Harry, thank you very much. All right, so everything I'm going to tell you guys today is probably counterintuitive to what you've heard about traditional strength training. Okay, I'm going to tell you you can get stronger with lighter weight and higher repetitions. As if you go someone, ask someone at a gym, how do I get strong? They're going to say, you're going to have to do heavy, heavy weight, and you have to do low, low reps. Okay, my name is Luke Criley. I did my thesis research on blood flow restriction training. The title of my thesis is the effects of a seven-week practical blood flow restriction training program on lower body strength and power. So kind of an overview of what we did was we took 62 well-trained male collegiate football players here on campus. We had a pre-test, post-test mixed model design with a single training intervention, that would be our BFR. We brought them in, this was during the regular off season. So what they did is they came in before they started their off season, they did a one rep max squat. So that tells us how strong they are, how much can they squat in one rep. Okay, then they did a vertical jump, that tells us how powerful they are, how high can they jump. They did their seven week training program, they did whatever intervention they did for our four groups. They ended the seven weeks, they didn't do the one rep max squat again, and then they did the vertical jump test again, and then we compared the two statistically to see what our results were. So what is BFR? What is blood flow restriction training? It's essentially exactly what it sounds like. It's the restriction of blood flow to working muscles during exercise. So let's take the bicep curl, for example. If we're doing a bicep curl, we're going to do BFR. We're going to take a wrap, and that's the kind of wrap I we used up there. We're going to wrap above the bicep, and what we're doing is we're wrapping tight enough to restrict the amount of arterial blood flow coming in, and we're completely including venous return. So long story short, what happens is you get a pooling of blood within the muscle that you're training, and that creates an optimal environment for muscle hypotrophy, and then it also creates anabolic strength processes, so you're going to get stronger using lighter weight. So that's kind of BFR in a nutshell. How we used it is we used a protocol of one set of 30 repetitions, with followed by three sets of 20 reps, with 45 seconds rest in between, only at 20% of their one rep max. So these football guys, say the guy can squat 100 pounds, he's only using 20 pounds for his BFR protocols. So kind of through the study, how it works is we had four different groups of those 62 guys. We had a traditional group or control, did nothing but the football workout. Okay, then our group number two, they did the traditional strength training workout with the football team, and then they did our BFR protocol, but they did not use wraps, so they were not under restriction. Okay, the third group, we're gonna call it my full meal deal group, they did the football workout, they did the BFR protocol, and they did so under restriction, so they had everything. Okay, then our fourth group was a modified, so they came in, they did the football workout, but they didn't do any heavy squats all year long. They never got any heavy weight on their back. They did the BFR protocol, and they did the blood flow restriction training. Okay, what we saw was across the board, all four groups got much, much stronger. Okay, that was what we were going to figure to see. Traditional strength training, you're going to get stronger. However, that full meal deal group, that group number three that did everything, got significantly stronger than all three other groups. They saw a 12.8% increase in strength over the seven weeks, and on average, they saw a 50-pound increase in squat strength over the seven weeks. So that's a legitimate amount of weight. Vertical jump, we did not see an effect on vertical jump. All four groups got better on vertical jump. If I had the figures, I would show you. Everyone increased, but it was increased the same. No one group did better than the other on vertical jump. So kind of conclusions from this are BFR on top of a traditional strength training program um, is effective in increasing strength, but not increasing vertical jump. <laughs> 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 <laughs>